Was um, there any specific moment when you thought, oh my goodness, this is a possibility to use this technology to make a vaccine all the way in the 1980s? So it, there was two kind of events. Um, uh, the first one was the aha moment about using gene therapy technology to produce vaccines. And um, that happened uh, because I was collabor I was working very closely with a, a kind of a postdoc mentor whose name is Dan St. Louis. He still lives in San Diego. And uh, Dan was working on a system where he would use retrovirus vectors to put genes expressing a secreted protein into cells of a mouse and then uh, collecting them in a little package and nodule, we could say, placing them as a transplant into the mouse and then the mouse would continue making the protein. Okay, so this was putting, you know, putting things into engineered cells in cell culture and then implanting them back in the mouse. That was the model using a retrovirus. And Dan ran into a problem. It was a huge paradox in the laboratory. The, the cells would produce the protein in the mouse for about three weeks, and then they would stop producing it. And uh, Inder's lab, where I was, Inder Verma, um, uh, one of the top uh, leaders at the time in uh, regulatory regulation of gene expression, um, and the others who were supporting him in that mission, uh, thought that this must be a, uh, what was happening was some sort of a control event that the retroviruses were getting turned off in the cells. And the aha moment for me, as somebody trained in medicine for uh, a couple of years and immunology and vaccines and all that was, uh, good heavens, this is happening at three weeks, which is exactly the timeline for a good, robust cellular and humoral immune response. Maybe, probably what's going on is not some epigenetic, uh, fancy chromosomal silencing thing, but rather simply that the mouse is making an immune response against the foreign protein. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, that was what happened. Now, it seems like a very small thing in retrospect, but it was heresy at the time. Uh, gene therapy had not yet come to confront the fact that it has this fundamental logic flaw, which is if you're putting the good gene into a patient, the patient's immune system doesn't know that it's the good gene. It only knows that it's a foreign gene and it will mount an immune response against it. And it will also mount an immune response against the vector if it's an adenovirus or a retrovirus or whatever. Okay, so, so this aha moment seems trivial in retrospect. At the time, it was a, a kind of heresy and uh, not well received, um, as you might imagine. Uh, but that, that was one of the key ones, was mm -hmm. gene therapy can be used. It, it may not ever, remember I come into this a true believer in gene therapy. This is going to be my career. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm in. I'm all in. Okay, uh, and suddenly the the epiphany. Oh, this isn't going to work so good. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Right? Because because if you've got an immune response, there's no going back. You know, then you're into immune suppression land and and really complex science, um, and that doesn't work very well. But the aha was oh. Um, one the way out of the woods is uh, that we can use gene transfer technology to make vaccines. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that was a key aha. And I thank Dan St. Louis for helping me and mentoring me at that time when when I had that brainstorm. Wow. The other one that mm -hmm. was kind of pivotal uh, was way downstream um, in happened uh, because of this serendipity that I was working with um, a non-viral method for transferring RNA into cells. And then because I was uh, working as a teaching assistant in an embryology course at, at UC San Diego, and I had extra Xenopus embryos. So these are basically early stage tadpoles. Mm -hmm. And I took the material that I had been using for cell culture to test. I was testing a whole large array of cell culture lines for the ability to put RNA into them. And I said, well, let's just see what happens with these frog embryos. And uh, 
those RNA experiments worked, to my great surprise, astonishment really. They worked wow. incredibly well. And um, then, then we, you know, the next stage in the embryology course was some experiments involving chick embryos. And so I, I did this kind of same thing. Well, if it works with frogs, what about chicks? Um, and lo and behold, I got signal with chicks. And uh, so at that point, um, then things got serious mm. and interesting. Um, and uh, disclosures were filed and oh, yes. uh, people started wrestling over who got ownership and, and all those kinds of things. And it all went sideways.